morning, folks. Good morning. My name is Mark Lindy, and I am the chairman of the Board of Library Trustees for Brockton. Um, I also run the community cable channels, Brockton Community Access, and a couple of weeks ago, I asked my Board of Trustees to have the library here for the city of Brockton, a place where everybody is welcome and everybody uses to be like the census center. So it's pretty appropriate that we have this meeting here today. I was on the complete census count committee back in 2009 with uh, Mayor Moses Rodriguez under the Harrington administration. And I think it is critical and crucial that everybody be counted here in the city of Champion. So I'm gonna do my best on cable TV to make sure that everybody knows what we're doing and how to be counted. And at this point, I am gonna introduce, first of all, I'll welcome you on behalf of Paul Engel, our library director who couldn't be here this morning. So that's why you got me. And uh, I will introduce now Cynthia Scrivani, who is the executive director of the Elections Commission here in the City of Champions. Hey, Cindy. Good morning. Uh, I want to also welcome you all and thank you all for coming to the 2020 census kickoff. We are here today, today to discuss the importance of the 2020 census and why it is imperative that we get an accurate count of all people in Brockton. Although the 2020 census may seem a ways away off, the census awareness campaign should start today. The immediate formation of a complete count committee will ensure that households are kept abreast of the various census operations. The more informed households are about the 2020 census operations, the better their understanding of the census process becomes, thus increasing their willingness to be part of the successful enumeration in 2020. The U.S. Constitution mandates a headcount every 10 years of everyone residing in the United States. This includes people of all ages, races, ethnic groups, citizens, and non-citizens. The population totals from the census determines the number of seats each state has in the House of Representatives. States also use the totals to redraw their legislative and school districts. The population totals also affect funding in our community. Approximately $675 billion in federal funding is distributed to communities each year. Census data is also used for forecasting future transportation needs for all segments of the population. It determines areas eligible for housing assistance and rehabilitation loans, assisting federal, tribal, state, and local governments in planning and implementing programs, services, and emergency <laughs> response, and also designing facilities for people with disabilities, the elderly, and children. At this time, I would like to introduce the Honorable Mayor Moses Rodriguez. Honorable, huh? Uh, good morning. Uh, first of all, I want to welcome the, the folks from the Census Bureau, the uh, folks from the State House, and members of the uh, legislative body that's here, all the guests from, uh, from the city government. And one of the things that I want to tell you is uh, I, I wrote absolutely nothing because the census exists right here as far as I'm concerned. Uh, our city has been, um, for the last God knows how many years, shortchanged by our lack of doing the right thing in terms of participating in the census. And this is something that at least for as long as I live within the city government, uh, it doesn't matter what part of the government that we're going to support the census this time around. And the reason why I'm saying that is if you sit down and think about it, um, the city of Lowell has a school population of about 15,600 and something, something, something. And they're in the books for 108,000 people. We have a student population of 18,000. How are we in the books for only 94,000 people? Think about that. And the difference between 94,000 and 100,000 means billions of dollars. I'm not talking about millions, billions of dollars that we have lost in the history of this city. And I will do whatever I can, even if I have to go door to door myself to make sure that we get people counted in this city, we're gonna do that. 
Because one of the things that I noticed in 2010, it was not the fact that people did not um, participate in the census, but what they did do is under-report. You know, you have a household with uh, six people and there's two bedrooms. Uh, people sometimes felt scared to say, yeah, there's six people living in this house, and they only put, it, you know, they only put down four people. Uh, this is something that we're going to take our time utilizing whatever resources we have to educate the people in this community saying, you know, if you have 20 people, put down 20 people. Nobody's going to come after you. Nobody's going to come back and say, there's, you know, you, your household is only designed for four and you've got 20 because we want to make sure that everybody gets counted in this community, in this city. We owe it to the people. We owe it to the kids in this community that don't get the benefits or don't get the, the federal funding that we should be getting it. And shame on us for not doing that. And I, uh, I honestly want to make sure that uh, the census folks and the state folks hear from us here in city government that we're going to support this uh, this time around at 100 percent and make sure that every single person in this community gets counted. I also want to make sure, and I'm glad the uh, Cindy is here, uh, we're going to hold off on the city census next year because I think what happened in 2010, we confused the heck out of people because we sent out a city census at the same time that the federal government sent out uh, the federal census. And I think people got confused. You know, they were, well, I've already done the, the census, you know, not realizing that the two censuses are totally different. So I'm going to ask whoever we need to ask to make sure that we hold off and, and try not to confuse people with the census next year to make sure that we get our duly God-given right to the funds that belongs to the city of Brockton. With that, I want to thank again everybody that comes here. Please work with us. Please volunteer when the call comes to help us out to make sure that we get every single citizen counted in the city. Thank you, and thank you for being here. Thank you, Mayor. I now would like to uh, introduce Georgia Lowe from the Census Division. All right, so my name is not Pedro. Um, as <laughs> Cindy said, my name is Georgia Lowe, and I'm with the U.S. Census Bureau. Um, I am part of the New York region, uh, which covers all of New England and upstate New York. I, not just upstate New York, all of New York and New Jersey and Puerto Rico. So that's our entire region. And I, am, I oversee the partnership program here in Ma Massachusetts. Pedro de Jesus, where are you, Pedro? Um, it is one of our partnership specialists, and he's right here in Brockton. Um, and we're the ones that are going to be doing the outreach to the communities across the state um, to reach out to all the populations to make sure we get a, the best possible count for the communities across Massachusetts. Thank you, Mayor Rodriguez, for having us here today. Um, local leaders, we really appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to you about the importance of the census uh, for your community. So with that, uh, a little bit of um, general information um, about the mission of the census to serve as the nation's leading provider of quality data about the people and economy. That's just generally speaking what we're going to be doing. Um, our goal for this census is to count everyone once, only once, and in the right place. That's our overarching goal. Um, so at the Census Bureau, we do the census every 10 years, but we do a lot of other work as well. Oops. Um, we're the largest statistical agency in the United States, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about the other work that we do so that you're all aware because it's very important. We collect data for over 130 surveys and programs each and every year. So we can conduct a number of demographic surveys. Um, we do the decennial census, of course. We have a survey called the American Community Survey, which is conducted on an ongoing basis, which used to be the long form on the decennial census, but now we're conducting that on a rotating monthly basis to have more up-to-date data for every community. Um, we do a number of other surveys on employment and unemployment, on health, crime. So we do all of these surveys um, for other government agencies primarily. Um, and we also conduct an economic census every five years and a census of government. So we do a lot of other work, and the point being we have a permanent staff of field representatives who are out in the field every day collecting data, not just every 10 years. So we, again, want everyone to, to be aware of all that other work that we do as well. But let's get back to the 2020 census. So 
It's mandated by the Constitution. We've been conducting it every 10 years for a long time, since 1790. Um, we aim to count every single resident in the United States. We have an increasingly diverse population, which brings along challenges. So we're expecting to need to count about 330 million people next year. All of our data is confidential, protected by law. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So um, Cindy already covered a couple of these points, but why is the census important and what do we use the data for? Um, well, it does determine the number of seats each state has in the US House of Representatives. So that is critically important that we get it right for that purpose alone. Uh, it defines congressional and state legislative districts, school districts, and voting precincts. Um, and this is a big one. It determines how more than $675 billion um, in federal funding are distributed each and every year. So for, a, for that purpose, you want to think about the numbers that we collect next year for the 2020 census are going to stay with every community for the next 10 years. So that's why it's so important that we get it right, as the mayor was stating, um, because whatever the population count that we obtain for, for Brockton um, in 2020 is, th that number will stick with you for, for the federal funding purposes uh, for 10 years. So it's important that we count every, every member of the community. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how we protect the data that we collect because this is an important topic that's on people's minds. Um, all responses that we collect are protected by federal law, Title 13. Um, any personal information that we collect stays with the Census Bureau and cannot be shared with any other government agency or court. Census Bureau employees like myself and Pedro are sworn to protect the confidentiality of the data that we collect for life. So even when we leave the Census Bureau, we're still bound by the oath that we took when we were hired. Um, violating that oath has severe penalties, um, up to $250,000 fine, up to five years in prison or both. Um, so we take this um, confidentiality very seriously and we are sworn to protect the data that we collect. Also, since we're going to be conducting this census online for the first time, the cybersecurity aspect um, is also important. Our program meets the highest and most recent standards. We've worked with agency um, or with experts in the, in the um, cybersecurity community to ensure that we've met the highest standards for collecting the data online next year. So. This infographic shows um, a little bit about the design of the 2020 census, and I'll just go over this very briefly. In the lower left-hand corner, it might be hard to read. It says establish where to count. So that's the first piece. We need to have a good foundation for the census, and th what this means is we've been updating our address database for the past you know, number of years to have the most accurate list possible. Um, of addresses that we will use to know where we're supposed to be counting people. Um, and that's still going on. We have a few more operations left, and I think John will talk a little bit more about that in his uh, piece um, in terms of updating our, our address list so that we have a good foundation for the census. Um, the next piece in the upper left is motivating people to respond. And this is a really important piece because we know that there are folks out there who will not respond unless they are motivated um, and influenced by someone in their community who they trust. So this is where the partnership um, program comes in that we're a part of, out there doing the outreach to the community organizations, the local leaders, the trusted voices in the community um, that people are going to look to when they get their census, note, you know, their letter in the mail, and, and they might ask you, um, should I do this? <laughs> and hopefully the answer will be yes, it's really important and here's why you should fill out your census. Um, so it, the partnership program is on the grassroots end. We also have a national t communications uh, campaign that we're working on with promotional materials that will, um, will be coming to, through the partnership staff to the local communities. Um, and there will be ads that you'll probably see um, 
TV, radio spots that will start next January so that when it's closer to census time so that we can, you know, really have this 2020 census brand out there getting people familiar with the fact that the census is coming. Um, then we get to actually counting the population. That's the next piece. Obviously an important piece. Um, so how we're going to do that this time around is a little bit different from how we did it in 2010 in past censuses. Um, we are, as I mentioned, going to be um, offering an online response option this time around, which is really exciting for the Census Bureau because we're finally you know, getting with the times. Um, and it also a lot offers a lot of opportunity for easy response options uh, for folks. So online, um, you can respond online, you can respond by phone for the first time as well. Um, you can also respond on paper if you choose to do it that way. Um, and lastly, you'll get a knock on the door if we haven't heard from you by a certain point in time by one of our census takers or enumerators. Um, so those are the four ways that people can respond to the census this time around. We hope to maximize the online option or even the phone option so that because that's the cheapest way to conduct the census and the most efficient way and we care about taxpayer money so the costliest way is to have someone physically come and knock on your door to try to get you to respond. Um, so again, we're hoping to do a lot of education, a lot of awareness through the local leaders and trusted voices in the communities to try to get people to respond online when they can. We're partnering with libraries um, like this to hopefully um, you know, bring people into libraries to respond there on their, the computers there if they don't have access at home, et cetera. So that's, um, oh, and I also want to mention, oh, no, I'll get to that, sorry. <laughs> and finally, we're going to release the census counts to the president um, by December 31st of 2020. That's our deadline. Okay, this is what I was uh, getting ahead of myself on a moment ago. So in addition to offering the, we're trying to make it as easy as possible for people to respond to the census. So one of the ways we're doing that is we're making sure to have a, a very strong, robust language assistance program. People will be able to respond online and by phone in English and 12 non-English languages. So um, those 12 languages you'll see in a moment. Um, our mailings will be bilingual in English and Spanish. The paper questionnaire is only available in English and Spanish. Um, and there will be language glossaries and guides and video guides available in up to 59 languages as well, trying to reach as many, you know, as many folks as we can to understand the census. And we also want to make sure that we hire at the local level, which is really important. I'll talk more about jobs in a couple of moments. But hiring at the community level, at the local level, is critically important because we want people to work in their own communities when it comes time to, you know, to knock on the doors of the folks who haven't responded. So this is a picture of all the languages that we're offering assistance in um, and the 12 non-English languages that are available online and by phone are the ones in the center in bold print. Okay. All right, so this is a bit of a timeline here. Um, so you can see where, you know, what we've done, what we're still working on, um, and what's to come. Um, last year, we started with the partnership program, really getting out and doing some, starting the outreach. Um, we started recruiting. We have tons of job opportunities available with the census coming. And um, so that began last year. Last year, we also started talking about complete count committees and how important they are to the census in the local communities. So we, some complete count committees started being formed at that time. And the state of Massachusetts, the Secretary Galvin's office also formed a state level complete count committee, a statewide complete count committee to be the umbrella complete count committee for the state of Massachusetts. Um, so this year, we are opening six offices in Massachusetts to support the field operations for the census in 2020. And um, so those are located, um, let's see if I can rattle them off. They are in Lawrence, Waltham, 
Worcester, Boston, Quincy, and East Bridgewater. So those are our six office locations. They are not public offices. I just want to make that clear. Um, people will not be going there to respond to the census or to apply for jobs or anything like that. The application process is online, so people can apply to all our jobs online. Um, but what the offices will do is support the field operations. They'll get people paid. There'll be clerks in the office supporting them in different ways. Um, and so, again, they're not public offices, but there are jobs in those offices. So we've hired managers for the offices for when they open, and they're set to open any day now within the next month or two. Um, we've hired managers, recruiting managers, administrative managers, you know, um, and, and we are still are hiring for the support positions in those offices. So if you know somebody who needs a job and can travel to Quincy or uh, East Bridgewater, um, there will be plenty of jobs available in those offices. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, advertising will start in early 2020. You might start seeing ads on your Facebook feed um, or Twitter. Um, you'll see, hopefully, um, you know, you'll hear information on the radio or um, see TV ads. So that will begin next year. Um, census day is April 1st. So we're, what, less than nine months away from uh, April 1st of 2020, Census Day. Um, our, we will begin to knock on doors for people who haven't responded around mid-May, and that will continue through July. So the response for the census will be taking place basically between mid-March, when we send our first letters out to all of the addresses to say, okay, it's time to fill out your census. Um, you can go online and do that, or you can call one of these numbers and respond. Um, and you can respond all the way through the end of July. Okay, that's the timeline. Um, okay, uh, that's just a map showing where the six offices are located. This is a slide that shows uh, all the jobs that we've got um, for, you know, for the census. We've already hired a lot of the manager positions for the offices that we're opening. But we still need help promoting the field positions. We need to recruit thousands and thousands of people across the state um, for the field positions, which are primarily the census takers, the enumerators who are going to be knocking on the doors, collecting the data. These jobs pay $25 an hour. They're part-time and flexible. If someone can be a census taker, um, um, you know, even if you have a full-time job, you can, uh, <laughs> you can, you know, $25 an hour. If you can work a couple of days a week, that's fine. You should go ahead and apply on 2020census.gov slash job, forward slash jobs. So that's the website that we're pointing people to. The portal is open. It has been open for several months. Uh, but we really need to build up the applicant pool so that come next year we have plenty of folks in the pool to hire to be, you know, knocking on those doors. Uh, there are some earlier operations that we're selecting people for now. Um, so if your name is already in the pool, you might get a phone call any day now, uh, or maybe you already have. Um, but most of the job, most of those field positions will be taking, will be hiring, will be hiring or selecting, will, you know, will be calling people to make job offers for those um, January, February. Um, and the work will start, you know, training March or April for the work to start in May. Just repeat the, the website again. Oh, it's 2020census.gov uh, slash jobs. Um, and there are some other positions available on usajobs.gov, which are some of the partnership specialist positions that we're still hiring for, um, and a few others as well. So, again, this is one area that we really need support um, with promoting these job opportunities. Um, okay, well, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide. It just kind of shows some of the, the environment that we're in and some of the challenges that we face, you know, mistrust of government, uh, rapidly changing technologies, and, you know, some of the others there. But essentially, we want to 
focus on how we're going to help to overcome some of those or how, how we're going to work to overcome some of those challenges, which is through our partnership program. The reason that we're here and the reason that we're going around the state, um, traveling to every community uh, who will have us to talk about how important the census is and how important it is for the community to get involved um, is because, you know, we, we know that having the folks at the local level um, talking to their own community members about the importance of the census is what's going to make us successful. We can't do it alone. You know, I can stand up here as a Census Bureau uh, representative and talk about why it's important, but um, the person who might be um, reticent about completing the census probably is not going to listen to me, you know, but they might listen to their local um, pastor or um, the person who um, they see at the bank or, um, you know, or their local elected official. Um, so it is really important that we have the, the support of the local communities and we thank the mayor for saying why that was so important earlier um, to have local involvement and support um, for the work that we're going to do because it's, it's going to benefit your community, you know, in, in terms of the federal funding for the next 10 years. So among other things. Um, this is just some examples of the folks that we're partnering with and the different organizations, school districts, because we know that it's important for children sometimes who, to bring home the message to their parents. Um, libraries are critically important partners for us for, you know, because they're community hubs, they have the computer resources and so on. Um, so. Um, these are some of our partnership initiatives, starting with complete count committees, and we hope that the city of Brockton will, you know, be forming a complete count committee because we know that this initiative really works. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but it does really work. So it just, you know, gets the local people talking about what, how to solve the problem in their community. Um, okay, so. Um, we do ask for a lot of support from our partners, and this is what we provide uh, to our partners, um, or this slide kind of highlights what we provide to our partners to support them. So we ask our partners to carry the message to their community members about why the census is important and why they should fill it out, and the fact that they should apply for jobs. Um, and, and we provide promotional materials, we provide um, flyers and posters. We, we have some materials now which, uh, which Pedro brought with us here today. Um, flyers on, you know, various aspects of the census, you know, uh, but, but we will have more coming. So we'll have posters and we'll have like, um, you know, different things that we can provide to create awareness, something to put on a window in a biz local business and, you know, other examples like that. We also will provide content for uh, digital mes messaging, so a sample email message to send to community members or to include in a newsletter, uh, drop-in articles that you can include um, in your, you know, however you're communicating with your community members, um, social media content for you to just be able to copy and paste a message out on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever, um, and graphics to go along with that. Um, so there's a website that's shown here, which has um, all of the materials that are, are available now, so you could even print your own <laughs> um, off of our website. Um, and we also support partners by being present. We would love to be at as many events as we can possibly um, be so that we can, you know, bring materials with us to be able to hand to community members, you know, where there's tons of festivals happening right now all throughout the state and you know we're trying to have a table at, at all of these various events so that we can um, you know just build that awareness um, and education um, so that people at least see the census out there and know that it's coming okay um, this just shows some examples of what partners uh, do <laughs> um, at when they become partners because every partner is different and you know some people ask us what do I need to do to be a partner with the Census Bureau I mean it can be as simple as just sharing the message on your 
website or having a link to the Census Bureau's site from your website or even just posting, you know, having a poster up in your local business or, at, um, you know, on a table at, at some event. So um, there are various things, you know, a whole host of things. Some folks, uh, some cities are translating materials into um, other languages. We will have lots of materials in other languages, but they're not ready yet. So some folks are getting ahead of the game and translating it for their own communities. Um, okay. Um, so complete count committees. Just to talk a little bit more about that, and we're, don't worry, folks, we're getting towards the end here. Um, so a, a complete count committee is really just a group of community leaders who come together to raise awareness about the 2020 census and to motivate their community members to respond. It's really pretty simple when you stop and think about it. That's really all it is. Um, so in terms of who should be on a complete com count committee, that's really up to, um, you know, every city is a little bit different, so that's really up to the local official to decide. Typically, the, the mayor will appoint someone to chair the committee. Um, and then from there, you want to include, you know, as many, probably everybody in this room would be perfect complete count committees. You were interested enough to come to this um, kickoff here today. Um, and so that means you care about your community. And that's, you know, ideal for, for the types of uh, individuals that should be part of the committee. But that's up to, up to the city to decide. But these are just some examples here in the middle. Um, so faith-based leaders, you know, senior services. We want to make sure we, I guess when you're thinking about this, you want to make sure that you're including um, a cross section, you know, so you want to get a broad spectrum of individuals and organizations as to be part of the committee so that you can make sure that you're reaching every segment of the population. Um, so, you know, in terms of getting started, again, every little, every city is a little bit different, but this kickoff is a great start. Um, you know, appointing someone to be the lead of the committee, the chair, um, and then just identifying the individuals and just picking a schedule and starting, you know, have a meeting. Um, and we have lots of other cities that have started, you know, so we can, we can always put you in touch with other um, communities that, you know, if you, if you need a little help. <laughs> um, so, okay. So um, when you're forming your complete count committee, you might have 25 or 30 people on this, on this committee, right? But because you want to make sure that you reach the different population groups, you might want to split that committee into a number of different subcommittees. And these re work really well because you, they focus on um, a different facet of the community. So you might want to have a small group of people, three or four people, working on the outreach to the colleges and universities. I don't know, I can't remember, Massasoit, but okay. Um, you might want to have a small group of people focused on um, faith-based initiative or um, immigrant groups, um, a specific language. It's really however you want to do it. You could even break it up by geography. Um, so these are just some ideas that, that we throw out there. We don't, you know, the Census Bureau has you know sort of a template and we have some literature that you can look at in terms of you know our, our ideas about what worked last time and what didn't work and the you know the in a general way how to go about it but it's really up to you um, so this slide just shows some activities that committees and subcommittees engage in um, it's really just about developing a local advertising campaign posting information on websites. Um, you know, some complete count committees print their own materials. They run PSAs on local media outlets. They translate materials. Um, they have kickoffs, media kickoffs, um, and, you know, just have different type of outreach events. Um, here's just one example of kind of a neat idea. When we did a test in Providence County, Rhode Island in 2018, um, somebody came up with the idea to have a fun run in Central Falls, Rhode Island. 
and um, it was a one mile fun run and it was just a kind of a play on the so the, the city of Central Falls is one square mile mm -hmm. it's a very tiny city geography wise so um, they used that and did a one mile fun run but anyway it was just to, to create awareness of the test that was happening um, and they made t-shirts and everything so it was kind of fun um, but there's you know lots of ideas out there about what the committee can do to to get the word out carry the message to their community members because you know best what's going to resonate with your community um, you know to to with the ultimate goal being to get everyone counted um, okay this is a tool that we have that's available to the public and it is helping us in our outreach efforts and it could help you as well and even though this is a map oh this is Brockton good for you I thought this was going to be a different uh, city because <laughs> um, so it, it essentially it breaks down the country by census tract you can look at every single census tract within the city of Brockton and it will tell you some demographic information some socioeconomic inf information about that tract and this will help us at the Census Bureau, but it can also help you in terms of the outreach that needs to be done to the different parts of the city. Um, so it just tells you about the population in that, within that tract, and it also assigns a low response score, which is kind of an estimated number of the number of people that will likely not respond unless they're motivated to respond. So it kind of this so this particular tract has a low response score of 30.9, which means that only about 70% of the population would respond um, without some additional motiv motivation. So we know that we're going to need to do some work in that area. Um, so you can take a look at that if you'd like. Um, here uh, we always want to make sure we tell uh, that we talk about our data dissemination program because it's a free resource that the Census Bureau offers back to um, our partners. And what it is is often people are looking for data um, on our, our, our website, which contains a, a wealth of data from all of the programs that we do. Um, but it's not always easy to access. So we have data expert or data dissemination experts on our staff who can do webinars, um, they can um, do presentations on how to access certain data, they, workshops and training sessions, um, and they're even available to, you know, to just for s questions. So um, that's a tool that we want to make sure that you know is available to you. And they've also started putting together some little training videos on that lower right if you want to check out census.gov slash academy. Um, there's some neat little videos on there. That's all I have. So um, thank you very much. Thank you, Georgia. Um, before I introduce our next guest, I would like to recognize the local officials who came out to support the 2020 Census Campaign kickoff, uh, City Councilor Ann Beauregard, School Committee Member Tim Sullivan, S Southeastern Regional Technical School Committee Member Mark Lindy, um, State Rep Jerry Cassidy, and of course the Honorable Mayor Moses Rodriguez. And our next guest will be John Barr from the Census Division. Thank you all for being here today. This is great turnout. Um, first, I want to offer our deepest condolences on the passing of Mayor Carpenter. Um, so Secretary Galvin has been the census liaison for Massachusetts for, uh, since the 2000 census, and we feel that this is going to be the most difficult count of all censuses so far. Um, but our office has been working now for about four years on the census. Most people think of the federal census, they think of April 1st of 2020. But there's a lot of behind the scenes programs that we've asked the municipalities to work on 
that really lays the foundation to make sure um, that we we can go into this uh, with the strong um, feeling that we're gonna we that the foundation is there to have a good count. Um, one of the things Georgia mentioned in the slideshow was the local update of census addresses program. Um, that we put a real emphasis on because if you don't, if the Census Bureau doesn't have that address, the form is never sent to that address and the people don't fill it out and um, obviously the money um, per, 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 per person does not go to the city and town and federal funding. So basically um, there's about 2.5 people per unit and when you think about that in, in, in federal dollars, that is a lot of money. So we, we went into the LUCA program and we feel like we, we, we've really, um, with the cities and towns of Massachusetts, we, we've done a pretty good job with that. Um, there's other programs behind the scenes that we've worked on with uh, early uh, non-response follow-up and that's more for off-campus college students. Um, there are different kinds of counts that go on. So for on-campus housing, in, uh, th that's called a group quarters count. So that includes prisons, on-campus housing for students, um, um, is, um, nursing homes, nursing homes um, and, and uh, shelters. So there's different counts and different ways things are done. So for, for us, um, making sure that Massachusetts has a strong foundation um, was, is critical. Um, obviously, we're here today to talk about uh, the uh, complete count committee and the grassroots efforts that we're going to need to make sure um, that Massachusetts gets as many people counted as possible and that, that Brockton gets its fair share of funding. Um, it's, it's, the federal census is about money, data, and power. Um, obviously, the count is also for the House of Representatives. It's for, you know, um, local governments, the, the, the legislature, it's for school committees. It, so the, the, all, this, all these um, things add up, and when you look at it, you realize, okay, there is so much money at stake, certainly represented in data. Data is used every day to make decisions. So um, some of the things that we try to talk about when we talk about census is the different kinds of, of ways people um, are looking at using the data to, to form, you know, to make decisions for businesses that go into a community. Or, or, or where you know uh, schools should be or libraries, so we're we're trying to partner with everyone um, for since for, for libraries are going to be critical to the count only because they can offer uh, computers to people that might not have it. Um, school departments are going to be critical because we need to get the word back to the youngest kids. Um, so if if a, if a child brings home something in their backpack and brings it home to their parents because children under five are one of the most difficult counts um, to, to have in, in, in the country. So we're trying to come up with different ideas to make sure that folks get counted. Um, I want to introduce some of the staff of the Secretary of State's office. We all have different roles within the office. Uh, Yuri Molina, Bill Palmer, and Lyda Hawkins. So um, we look forward to having a dialogue with you and answering any questions that we can. Uh, going into today. Thank you very much. And last but not least, I would like to welcome uh, Pedro de Jesus up here. Yeah, it was a pleasure for me uh, working for the Census Bureau again. I did it this one in 2010 in the city of Brockton and different communities. So we want to, this complete count committee, we gotta, this time we gotta get the job done to get the mark of the city that we got more than 100,000 people. So with all your help, we can accomplish this. Thank you. And that completes our 2020 census kickoff. I want to again thank everyone for coming and enjoy your day.
Can one girl in a small town, an architect in a major city, and a suburban high school coach shape the future of the United States? Yes, they can. Because every 10 years, the census gives us that power. You can shape your future by responding to the 2020 census. Where do we need new roads to make our lives easier? Where will new school programs help our children thrive? Where could a new health clinic benefit neighborhoods? The 2020 census will inform these decisions and shape how billions of dollars will be distributed to communities like yours each year. And in 2020, you can respond to the census online, by phone, or by mail. It's easy, safe, and important. Make sure you and everyone you know is counted. Now is the time for you to get involved. Your community needs you. Together, we can educate and excite, inspire and make sure every voice is heard. Together, we can shape our future.